Hello everyone and thank you for coming to this Kendall Hunt webinar today, Content Mastery, the Powerful Potential of Your Chemistry Laboratory, presented by Greg Jaline. Uh, we are really excited to talk with you today about kind of the system that uh, Greg has developed and refined to really help connect with his students and get them really deeply rooted in chemistry concepts through the laboratory as a means. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. We will be taking questions throughout, so you can either throw them into the chat or Q&A functions, or if you use the little like raise your hand function, uh, we can have the, you ask them live as well, whatever you prefer and are comfortable with. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded and that will be sent to you in the coming days after the webinar. And before we get started, I'd like to take a couple minutes to just introduce our speaker today. Um, Professor Jolene earned his bachelor's at Georgetown University and his PhD and did postdoctoral work at Cornell University uh, with focuses on physical and theoretical chemistry. He was faculty for eight years at Notre Dame University before moving to Texas Tech University, and he has published more than 75 research articles and has earned various teaching excellence awards while at Texas Tech. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Greg. Thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, uh, good. Thank you for that kind introduction, Megan. And thank you to all the attendees for being here. Um, you were, you know, most of you are coming into the home stretch right at the end of the term. And there's a lot of students with a lot on their minds right now. We tend to be very popular. So I appreciate you giving an hour of your time at this point. Um, what I want, I'll be telling you about uh, uh, General Chemistry Laboratory manual and digital support that we put together at Texas Tech. And I want to give you a little bit of the philosophy that, that's that gone behind it before I actually take you into showing you some of the nuts and bolts on the digital side. Um, and really the idea is motivated by sort of leveraging the laboratory experience to enhance the chemistry content material that if you like dominantly comes from the lecture side. So taking the laboratory course more from just being um, instruction on techniques, data collection, and analysis. So what kind of big picture sense we did in terms of reinforcing lecture course, lecture course content? The Some of the areas, right? I'm sure many of you see the same kind of issues. We see them, right? There's, there's places where your content from the lecture course hasn't been presented yet. You lost your synchrony for one reason or another, maybe you're doing an Adams first approach from the lecture side, always difficult to make a, a, a laboratory sequence that matches that well. We see more and more students that have taken the lecture course in a previous term. So there's a little bit of uh, content loss, memory loss from having taken it in the past. And then for sure, right? Students, a lot of students making their first pass through the course on the lecture side don't have the content fully internalized. Where do the, how, what do we do? And we'll show, I'll show you some details, but here's the big picture. Each of the pre-labs is designed to review the chemistry concept principles that are underlying the experiment, the big picture part of the chemistry that is controlling for that particular experiment. Then go on to make explicit connections between the particulars of that experiment to these larger chemistry concepts. So students have a sense of the why and the connections before they actually go into the laboratory and do the experiment. And then there are integrated questions. All of these parts come together and act in these students who are not quite getting it yet, right? As sort of a chemistry content booster shot uh, within the laboratory context. So as we develop our course, what sort of guiding principles helped us pull this together? Okay, here's the same idea, this sort of content mastery multiplier. This, as I mentioned, we'll look at the we're going to review broad underlying concepts and then how the experiment connects to those concepts. Very, very much using questions to engage the students. How do we use those questions? They're, they're very interactive. They're seamlessly integrated with the content in the pre-laboratory part of the course. So students are not reading in one place, going to another website for questions. These questions are both qualitative and quantitative. Right? And so it's not so a lot of the whys behind the chemistry are more qualitative than they are just numerical. And in the pre lab, they rehearse the data analysis, the data interpretation, so that they are, when they go to take the data, they are uh, in a good place to know the context in which that data is going to be used. 
All the questions are algorithmic. There's detailed feedback. There's hints that are you can turn on, turn off, assign penalties or not. All of this in place, you can have multiple attempts. All of this in place to help promote self-learning from the students um, when, when they're working on these assignments. Machine grading, super big part of what we wanted to do here. All of the pre-lab instructional questions are machine graded. The data and analysis reports that they submit, machine graded. There's post-laboratory questions, yes, machine graded. The system allows for free response questions. Uh, there, there are none in place and right now at Texas Tech being used. We were going to rely on this machine grading pretty heavily. So we stayed away from where a human would have to come in, right? A machine for a pre response question. But that is certainly can be added into the questions available. This is kind of the table of contents. What we have, we have 12 experiments, right? You don't have to memorize this and get take a quiz on it. But if you sort of scan it, I think you'll see that this is this this particular course supports a one semester chemistry course, which is like the G part of a GOB. Um, dominant two uh, registration streams streams for this laboratory course are pre nursing and uh, some of our agricultural science majors. Okay, one thing I want to mention: each one of the experiments is fully self contained in terms of its content, uh, discussion of methods, discussion of techniques so that the order in which the laboratories are presented can be rearranged with no worries at all. One never, one is never referring to as you learn an experiment one, for example. Okay, so this connection and supporting content mastery of lecture concepts really happens in the pre-lab assignments dominantly, right? There are four components in every pre-lab assignment. There's an introductory part, that's where these big picture core principles of chemistry that are going to be explored or exemplified by the experiment, that's where that's presented. Second section about the experiment, that's where the particulars of the experiments are looped back to connect with these larger concepts. There's a methods part, two types of methods, two broadly types of methods, laboratory techniques and data analysis methods. And then there's always a section on the specific highlight, highlighting specific safety issues for that laboratory. Bit more about the methods part, what's going on. Uh, I put them in four buckets methods about instruments that are used, equipment that's used, techniques uh, used, and then data analysis. What's happening in parentheses is those, the experiment number from that table of contents. So, for example, balances are used in a large number of experiments. The module on how to use a balance, including you know questions they are all algorithmic so they'll see different questions when they see it that's repeated in multiple experiments transfer pipette used just only in experiment nine volume measurements much need used much more extensively throughout um we find that this works really really well the booster shot on a technique in a later experiment even though you use it in an earlier experiment in your pre-lab work is very helpful to the students uh, as we all know, students don't get it on the first time. Students don't do all of their assignments every time it's assigned. So we're repeating them as they are used in the laboratory has a lot of benefit for our, our students. So the students have worked through the pre-laboratory part, and then there's two other parts of the, the actual physical laboratory, take data, submit reports and post-lab, and then I'll have a few things to say about the way the actual lab manual is organized. So this data and analysis report, uh, our students go into the physical laboratory, they take the, they perform the experiment, take the data. There's data sheets in their lab manual, which are very uh, organized to post them in the, the data they need to record. The, uh, when they come out of the laboratory, at some point they go back, they get back online, they'll transcribe that data into the online data analysis report, which looks, that the data part of that looks very much like the page in their lab manual, so the trans transcription error. Uh, very much minimized. They are then guided into the second half, which is the analysis. Uh, there's hints available in that analysis with uh, instructors can assign penalties or not to those hints. And then after that, followed up with some post-lab questions. They come in maybe two families. One family is the what-if question, which tends to focus on procedural mistakes. If such and such mistake was made. What might the data have turned out to look like? And then there are questions that are sort of multi-concept that integrate uh, big picture and focus, you know, parts from those pre-lab stuff into a pre-lab question. What about the lab manual? 
Well, because all this pre-lab content methods, that instructional is all happening online with, with the integrated questions that they answer about it. The manual contains only the procedures and the data sheet. So if you like the part that you actually need in the laboratory, okay? We put a lot of thought into these procedures and you try to stay away from this cookbook approach. I, it's hard, students really do gravitate to that kind of an interpretation of what they're supposed to do in laboratory. What we tried to do to break that up was to organize the procedures into, if you like, blocks, chunks of procedures, where the purpose of that chunk is identified to the student. So as they do the next three, four steps, they know what they're trying to accomplish with that chunk onto the next chunk. What am I trying to accomplish? Um, sort of the natural way that you think about how experiments would sort of proceed. Here's an example of experiment three in our laboratory. They, pre they prepare a mixture of sodium chloride, silica, and calcium carbonate, and then they uh, separate that mixture and find out if you, they know how much they put in, they find out how much they get at the end after they separate it and compare the analysis to, of what they've gotten at the end to what they put in at the start. So this is the flow chart that, that comes out of the uh, online part of the manual as, they, as they're being described why and how and what the different separations that they'll do. Here is just a, uh, an excerpt from what's in the lab manual from the procedure part of it. So step A, prepare the mixture. You're going to prepare this. There's three major steps to doing it, but while you're doing it, you know this is what you're accomplishing. Step B, just to go in order, this first extraction, there's one sub-step. Okay, fine. On to step two, there's eight parts to getting this second step done, decanting and filtering to make this separation. But again, that's what you're accomplishing all the way down through it. And then every experiment ends with some kind of cleanup type, um, if you will, little set of, of instructions, depending on what you need to do, chemical disposal, equipment return, and so on and so forth. So again, we're trying to, our students be very well organized in what you're trying to accomplish, not just what do I do next, what do I do next, what do I do next. We're gonna go take a look at the online content now, and I'll just remind you a little bit Right, so I want to we're going to the highlight again. These we're going to look at the reviewing of big picture concepts, some of this explicit connection of the experiment to those concepts, and then we'll be looking at the way uh, engagement is promoted by the embedded questions being machine grade. So I'm going to about switch over to another screen to go online. Not a terrible break point if there's any questions or comments from anyone who wants to jump in now at this sort of overview stage. Okay, all quiet on all fronts, let's go forward. Um, good. All right, so I've taken you to the development platform where, where this is built rather than the deployed platform where our Texas Tech students are um, working through these assignments right now. It's live in our course. We've been using this now for, uh, well, I guess it'll wrap up two years, come May or maybe the end of the summer. And uh, just to give you a sense, we have about a thousand students annually that take this course. So from that point of view, this the a lot of the nuts and bolts of the digital part has been battle tested. So here are the 12 experiments you saw before and one you didn't see, something I've just put together to use for demonstration purposes. Here are those three major components, the pre-lab work, the data analysis, the post-lab work. What I've chosen to do is rather than plow through one experiment, and we can do that, but is to just take pieces of pre-lab from some experiments, one experiment's data analysis and post-lab from some experiments to give you a flavor of what's used and, and what's, what's available. These, this is, these are all saying resume, that could be true for a student. They can do part of the work and come back. It's true for me because um, I kind of go in and out of this as I show this to different people. So here are the, there are these three points we raised. These are the three major subcategories of a pre-lab, the introduction about the experiment methods and the safety part. These pieces take something from one, from experiment one, experiment six, experiment seven, uh, and the ABCs are 
focused little module. So there's an A part, a B part. This one actually has a B part that follows it. The idea is that each one of these is largely single concept and not too onerous to look at. Here's the whole assignment if I scroll. So there's info presented and then there's a question for the students to do. And that's the general sense of it. Uh, giving students the opportunity to be part of it, work on it for 20 minutes, the pre-lab, maybe come back next day, later the same day, and you know do a little bit more work. So this is it's early on in the course, experiment one, right? So this is about uh, measurement uncertainty, measurement errors, uh, content delivered on 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 uh, relative errors, absolute errors, how the calculations are done, and it, the an example calculation where these expressions are used explicitly, and then the student is asked to do a, a calculation very much like the example calculation. So they are given a yeah. This these bold parts are algorithmic, so. There's multiple metals here, each one with their own correct density. And then they are told three density measurements were made. This experiment, they will do to make the measurement of the density of a, of a metal in the laboratory. So this piece of it sort of foreshowed if it's going on there. These are all algorithmic to be in the neighborhood of the correct answer. And then they are asked to calculate the absolute error the, and the percent error. I'm not gonna put any answers in for this part of it, but I wanna show you this. If you turned on multiple tries are allowed, the student would then see this kind of a feedback. And I want to emphasize the feedback uses the algorithmically generated numbers. You can see the 11.1 minus the true number of the 11.343 and what the student is supposed to do to get the answer. And same over here in terms of doing that. And so the and the so students very much appreciate that's my experience, seeing the actual numbers in their feedback rather than a generic answer because they like to track that number through the calculation and see how it was supposed to have been used. All right, let's jump a little deeper into the semester. This is a um, an experiment on solutions and salvation. So hydrogen bonding is part of the introductory work. Here you're seeing a figure you might see out of write your lecture textbook dealing with hydrogen bond between um, using fluorine, nitrogen, and oxygen. Typical graph of the way boiling points are affected by not only molecular weight, but in particular emphasizing the hydrogen bond parting of it. And here now two embedded questions. Let me also emphasize the students never lose track that there's a question. They're all sitting in these boxes. They have these blue headings. And so they know there's work to be done. And so this is one where they're going to consider the boiling points of these and then determine the effect of the hydrogen bonding of HF. And as they look and see, is it, the, is it, the, is it, and they're gonna ask to choose, answer questions about the graph. And the correct answers would be it's intermediate and it's hydrogen bonding. And these answers are in the, cut, the text here. So some of these act like reading questions and, and they are, so the students, and I know what students will do. I, do. I think you do also. Many students will say, what question do I have to answer? Okay, let's go back up here and now find the information to answer that question. So this, so this is a question where they have pull down uh, menus to check to to uh, choose from, and the HF is the largest. So I'll get that one correct. Talk a little bit about mixed hydrogen bondings uh, between molecules, and then again decide can different pairs algorithmically of molecules. And they hydrogen bond. So that's where the questions work something over there. There's the, of course, I got these wrong. Look, I'm a very good student up here. And again, feedback specific for the question. Uh, sometimes the feedback will tell you, you see a particular bullet point, see a particular part of the reading for the full explanation rather than just copying that text into the feedback box. Okay, I have one more to look at this. This is a, this is a, uh, actually experiment seven follows the solution ones. They synthesize soap. There's a discussion of my cells going on uh, in the operation of soap. Here is uh, a matching kind of question where they're given six terms. The six terms is taken out of 12 or so terms. Definitions are presented to them and they are uh, then, Need to need to determine which one of these are correct, right? And so 
again, <clears throat> I've made, I've, this is a true story. I'm going to tell you a true story from my life. Don't do that a lot. But my children are all done with school, out with, you know, having a good life. Once upon a time, back somewhere around junior high, maybe the beginning of high school, I decided it didn't look like anybody was doing homework anymore. And I said, what kids do? Any homework? What, you know, guys aren't doing any homework last couple of days. And the answer I got back was, we don't have any homework. We were just told to leave. And I think you know that idea. If this is in your manual and you should read it, they go, good, done, did that, right? But if you actually have to answer questions about the reading, you go, oh, okay, I got to find out what this is. I will search out in here. And so this really does promote work. Okay, so that was just a little bit of a sampling. Let's go and see what kinds of assignments and content would you see in the about the experiment. So we're in experiment two now, which deals with some aspects of solubility. Uh, and they, they experiment two, they have to identify a compound based on its boiling point, its solubility in solvents and its density, uh, a liquid compound, and off, off of a menu. So they're going to identify that. So we talk about the polarity of substances with these electropotential uh, maps in there. And then there's a question here where they're asked to recognize the positive and negative side, the dipole side of that. And this, this picture is algorithmic, okay? And each time they're being asked to look for the most negative charge, they're coached up here, look, let's look for the red. And what are you going to get it right? I'll be smart for that. And again, feedback specific for the options in, in this one. Try again. We have another molecule. Now I want to say the red is the nitrogen. And again, Oops. oh, I clicked the wrong button. Oh well, I'm gonna do. I want. I'm go, that one. I got wrong. I want to see. I'm gonna do it. I click the bromine, and if I manage to click the right button, what I do, and now the feedback is about bromine. We do gas discharge lamps for looking for uh, atomic emission spectrum. Discussion. So now we learn about the experiments. We're talking about the particular experiment. So discussion about discharge lamp work, a connection to everyday experience that the fluorescent lights in, that they're very familiar with are in fact discharge lamps. Here are some reading questions about discharge lamps. Here are the actual discharge tubes they will use. Okay, and so they will they will do spec they will observe spectrum of hydrogen, helium, neon, and argon. Photograph of what the discharge looks like. Again, kind of a reading ish, because it's actually a picture, but okay. And they would match it, but they're not a very good matcher. They thought this looked like it. So they said, this is argon. And they would say, see, it's actually the correct answer is hydrogen. So go compare this image to the hydrogen. Image. And then if you like, if, you, if you're an instructor, you said, yep, have another try. Have another try, and they'll get a different discharge. Can't get a lot of different ones because there's only four to pick from. But in this case, the, so the algorithm isn't that deep, but you can certainly get the idea. <clears throat> they also, in this solubility experiment, they look at uh, saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated salt solutions, and so there's a discussion about that. There are some calculus, some quantitative calculations where they will determine based on solubility in a particular amount of solvent, say like uh, uh, what mass would dissolve in 83.4 grams of water for this given solubility. Here's how you would do it. If a solution contains this many grams of the potassium nitrate in 112 grams qualitatively, is it saturated, supersaturated, or unsaturated? Here's how you do it. And then they get a question that looks very, very much like the sample calculation. Uh, the salt, the amount, whether, and then the second part, whether it's saturated, unsaturated, supersaturated, all algorithm. Uh, techniques in the laboratory to induce nucleation. Here's some techniques. Let's read about it. And then here is the reading question that follows up uh, in a matching way. This short little snippet of information about the technique belongs to this Into methods, we've got some methods that are both uh, 
as I mentioned early on, we have technique methods and data analysis methods. So here's a very simple method. Let's check the uh, pH of a, paper, of a solution with litmus paper. So you're talking about how you use the stern rod, put it on the litmus paper, maybe on a watch glass. Good. And the colors, the interpretation of the colors for red and blue litmus paper. And then here's a reading question. The color of red litmus paper under acid conditions. And again, the answer is, is on the page for you. So it's a reading question. Red litmus paper under acid conditions stays red. So the student is coached to pay some attention to this table and how to use it. And not oh, one of the students. And there we have it again. So the feedback is very specific for that, the question that was asked. Here is a method dealing with data analysis. So how would you do percent error data analysis? Uh, and so there is the general formula. This general formula then applied in an example calculation where, uh, and this is that separation experiment they need to do. So the student found these percentages of the sodium chlorides, the silica, and the calcium carbonate. That's what they found. Or is that the actual one? Oh, I'm sorry, I should use a little better. Yes, these are the actual, this is what the student found. Calculate the percent error in each one of these findings. It's walked through, then they get an example calculation that parallels this. And also, right, this also foreshadows the kind of calculation they will do in their data analysis for this experiment. They will prepare it. They will say that's the known amount. They will analyze it, and then they will do percent error in their analysis. So that, and so in the pre-lab, they are doing the kind of calculation they need to do as they analyze their own data a day or so later. Here's another technique in that soap synthesizing experiment. Uh, they do a vacuum filtration. So here's the vacuum filtration apparatus. Here's discussion of all the pieces and the parts that go into it and their functions and how it's assembled. And the, and of course, once again, reading questions. And so now set up as a matching, the, there's 12, 14 or so pieces all labeled. The diagram is reproduced, but now they're ABCs. Five of them are presented, not all are represented. And so the student will spend some time going back and forth and saying, what's G? Okay, what's G? G is here, G is here. I've perforated this, perforated this, add it. And they are forced to sort of interact with this figure and um, get a sense of how it's put together. How do you set up and use it? Can't get away from saying these are the steps. Once again, the sub blocks, you assemble it, uh, then connect it to the vacuum trap, okay? Then use it. And then there's some parts that don't have, right? So we try to organize this again in big pieces with sub steps. What's the reading question here? Here are some of these big pieces and you are asked to put them in the correct way. So it just shows another kind of question type available to the students. One more piece here. Burettes, they show up a couple of times. Again, there's some components to burette. Here's their components. Here's a question where algorithmically they get an image and you should read the meniscus properly. There's actually another piece in this. See, it, the burette's part of this is a piece before with the volumes that talks about meniscus and like reading meniscus properly. Then that tech, the meniscus part is applied to the burette. When we talk about burettes in this piece, that's why this is 10.3C. Again, you gotta prepare a burette for use so you can clean it and condition it. And then you actually, um, in terms of the, using it, rinsing it, and again, what's, what order do these steps in? So this uses that same kind of, like, of a motif where students can rearrange these, go back into the steps and figure out what is the correct way. Finally, the last piece of every free lab is, um, the safety part of it. There are this, this, this bottom question looks the same all the time. The answers change. So we ask them what personal and protect and other protective equipment do they need for this laboratory? In our laboratories, they are always wearing lab coats. They are always wearing goggles. That's those two answers are always correct. Okay. This experiment has a component where you also need gloves. So the answers to what they're doing is up here. So we're just again focusing on it. 
we do have an environmental hazard with respect to these organic liquids. You know, that's happening over here uh, and so on, right? There's a burn hazard with the hot plate. And this does not use any strong acids and bases. Oh, I'm just one of these things I wasn't paying enough attention. Okay. And so then you go, you can have, you can, you can have, a, a, you can allow this to have multiple choices. Um, you, you could think about, you have to take your safety, make sure you finish your safety quiz with 100% score before you do your experiment. You could organize schemes like that if you wanted to have that kind of uh, documentation that they were trained on the safety part. Of it. So that takes me through these four big components of the uh, pre lab work. The introductory part, big pictures in chemistry, the about the experiments, the particular experiments connected back to the big pictures, methods, techniques, and analysis, data analysis, and then a safety plan. Not a bad time for a pause for a question that might be coming along the way. Okay. And again, just a reminder okay. if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. No, not at this time, it looks like. Okay, and I want to emphasize, you know, another piece, just to say what, you, you know, big picture, right? Each one of these is a manageable size chunk, maybe you can call it a chunkette, I'm not sure, right? And there is nothing that they are presented on any of these that does not have a question to answer. Sometimes two, but not like 12, okay? So that, so they, there's an engagement part that they are essentially required to do, if you like as they work through each one of these. Um, good, let me, I'm gonna go back to the table of contents now. And I wanna jump in now. So they've done their pre-lab. They went to the laboratory, took some data, time to come back home and enter that data and do the analysis. The one that I've selected is this, uh, I think I want to say it's experiment two. It's an experiment where they burn magnesium ribbon uh, and then from the mass of the magnesium oxide and the original mass of the magnesium, they determine the mass percent of magnesium and oxygen in um, the ribbon. So this top part here is what their the data sheet looks like in their lab manual. And I have some numbers written down in here. So they have to take the mass of the crucible and its cover. I'm just going to, uh, I'm just not, I'm making, I'm going to make these round. They would obviously have milligram measurements here. Okay. The, then they put some magnesium and they get that combined mass. Okay. Then they do the experiment, it combusts, they do some workup on the product, they dry it, and then they measure the product now sitting inside the crucible with its cover. They, they're gonna heat the constant weight. Our constant weight is uh, within 50 milligrams. So that's their first measurement. Then they heat it again, come back and take the second measurement. This student has satisfied the 50 milligram requirement. So they were done. And this is a little wrinkle and I kind of want to show you how we handled it. There is no third, there is no uh, fourth eating, fifth eating for this student. They're done. They get to leave it blank. The program will score it wrong because it's looking for an answer, but the program is then also set up to say there's no points associated with this. At the end, they must put in this and, and You'll understand why this is true. So they repeat whatever their last one is because it's a, different students will have different amounts of heating cycles. But if you will, to get, grade them on their correct answers in the analysis, we have to enter this is the number that's used for their final mass, whether they need how many, no matter how many times. So it's going to either be this here, here, or here. It's going to be one of those numbers. And they're coached to get that correct over here. After they've entered their data, they're then coached to click the verify button. What does that do? I have to go back and find out why these are out. And don't worry about those things actually being marked as correct. That's a little bit odd. What they are then coached, now they, this is the analysis part. They are then asked to 
work through the analysis, do subtraction of these two, get the mass of the magnesium, so on and so forth, piece of the pieces. They will put their answers in here. This will ultimately be machine graded. There are these little standardized things letting them know. There are some no penalty hints that are set up to be designed to be no penalty. What are they? They were equations that were developed in the pre-lab part. So if they want to see that hint, some of these equations are trivial, like the mass of the sample is the mass of the sample plus the container minus the mass of the container. That's exactly how it's presented to them in the pre-lab. So if you will, a trivial sort of equation, okay? The, and then some of them are specific. So the hint on analysis 1A, every one of these questions is worth one point. So this is a 2% deduction. That's a laboratory coordinator has chosen that. You get asked, do you really want to take it? Yes, I do, okay? And then it tells you for analysis 1A, the answer there, take data line two and subtract data line one. I would go up to here and say, oh, data line two, subtract data line one, and that's the mass of the magnitude. Okay. And that would allow the student to continue forward when they're doing their lab report at 3 a.m. the day before it's due. Um, they can, and, and so it helps our students move forward to correct answers with whatever penalty you want to associate in terms of this and that. And then that would go all the way through, and then they'd be done. And you can you can let them do their analysis more than once. You can have them only once, and then they're able to submit the. Um, submit, you go ahead and submit this. Well, that would end the data and analysis part for an experiment. Some of them have more analysis. Some of them have more data. Um, and finally, the last piece. There are some post laboratory questions. Again, I've chosen them from some different um, experiments, much like I did in the pre-lab part of it. This to give you a little bit of a flavor of what's out there and some of the question types. So this comes from experiment two. This was our solubility part. So here are some um, two, or again, the bold part is the algorithmic. So there's a, there's a menu of some 30 organic liquids. These are both insoluble in water. They're told um, which, and in the question here, they're told when you put uh, the methyl T butyl ether, ether, they don't really need to know what this is. They just know that with water, it's in the bottom phase. Determine the relative density of water and that organic. The carbon tetrachloride is in the upper phase with water, what's the relative density, and then, here to synthesize these two thoughts, knowing their relative density with respect to water in each of these two, what is their relative density with respect to each other? And they can get hints, and the hints are organized on the part. So there's one hint that is equally applicable to A and B, and then a hint applicable to part C. There's a limiting reactant question, uh, laboratory, they, are, they work through that. And there, here is one of the questions they do at the end, which is a very, very uh, lecture side textbook looking question. Here's the chemistry. Here's the mass of one reactant. Here's the mass of the other reactant. Which is the limiting reactant? How much product can you make? How much of the uh, excess reaction is left over? Um, sometimes it is out there. Sometimes they're asked to put in the unit. Sometimes the unit is forced. So or, right, so they're told to put in their unit, they're told the precision to put in their answers, use it in grams, but do not type the G. You put a G in here, it's going to be scored wrong because this question is looking for a numerical. Uh, and some of that, if it's tripping over the, if they trip over those makes those mistakes early in the term, they stop doing it. And some of that can be repeated, can be taken care of by letting them have another try of the question. If I take another try, this one, the, the chemistry is not algorithmic. There are many questions where the chemistry is algorithmic. This one is a fixed chemistry. So if you look at this 19.414, now we have limits. And it will also change what, which is a limiting reagent. Right, fifty percent of the time, it's one or the other. It's set up to work that. Last thing I have to show you from the website, and I really this is here with our one of our last experiments of the term where they prepare and see how a buffered solution resists the pH change, the pH meter. 
So this describes the sort of the titration of a weak acid with a strong base. You're setting up the buffering region, you're in the buffering region, you swamp and gone out of the buffering region. That discussion, they're reminded of that in the question, and then they are presented with some titrations and asked to identify different regions of these titrations. So, and this, I want to show you the question motif. Click on the region where the buffer has been swamped. There's the right answer. And there's some wrong answers. This just lets them know what they picked. You can actually pick them all and you can get it wrong. Pick one of them. Click the region where the buffer has not yet been established. Pick the region where the system is well off. And you then get feedback showing the correct, your answer and the correct answer. Okay, so different kind of, just want to show you this motif where there are, you will images with answers and you actually click on the image to enter your answer. That, This is what I was, was going to show you uh, from the online portion, which I think we need to hear. So, um, the floor is yours, everyone. Wonderful. Well, we do have some questions right off the bat here. Um, one of them is because every lab tends to have its own nuances as far as what exact equipment is used, would there be a way to kind of use this sort of online technology um, and still not confuse students? Yes, that, and uh, that's a great question. And for example, <clears throat> the one, the data, let's say the, the, data, the experiment I showed you data for when they we're going to get the percent composition of magnesium and oxygen in the magnesium oxide. First thing they did was they measured the mass of the crucible and the lid that they were going to heat it. Right? There is a there's a correct answer to that. That correct answer has a pretty wide plus or minus range for that, and it covers the ranges of the crucibles and lids that they are with generous boundaries that they are presented in the laboratory to use if so if that so the adoption of this to use that there would be a, a discussion time to say what kind of equipment do you use so for example if you use a different size beaker to hold a sample when you do it on a balance or you use weighing paper or you use a weighing boat all of those nuances the steps in the procedure could be edited to say weighing boats instead of weighing paper. The mass range for the weighing boat that you're not tearing the balance, you're actually going to do it by contraction. The mass range for the acceptable answer for the weighing boat, it's great or correct. Those would be adjusted. So there is a little bit of uh, coordination time, shall I say, to uh, adapt these experiments to if they're done very right, along the same lines, the nuances of the equipment that might be used in your laboratory so the machine grading is done correctly. Um, and maybe there's another bigger picture question. I'll take a I'll just take the liberty to answer it. If there's an experiment that you find really, really valuable for your students, it's not really well represented in, in the dozen that are here. Um, with the lead time that the Pre-lab, post-pre-lab, you know, the, the four components of that, post-lab, data analysis and report, working a little bit back and forth, that, that experiment, it, it's really quite feasible to be incorporated into the uh, version of this lab manual that you would use at your institution. Perfect. Uh, we've got a question from Katrina. Do all chem labs in your major sequence use platform or is it just used in your freshman chem lab sequence, i.e., are you using this for analytical, instrumental, advanced lab courses, et cetera? The short answer to that is no. Right now, it's just being used in this one semester um, general chemistry course. As I mentioned, that it is, of course, populated. The two big population streams are pre nursing and agriculture, some of the agricultural science majors. Um, <clears throat> the 
they they could be um, incorporated into uh, higher. You could use this. Um, there, in principle, there's really no reason not to. Um, there's a, there's a fair amount of work to actually write it. That's I can say that from very much personal experience. Uh, but there's a lot of value to the student when it's in place. Uh, so that I get, yeah. I mean, if there's something bigger looking in that answer, there's nothing to, at least from my point, as I know, I see somebody here has asked what, what a platform it is on. This is, uh, the platform is Mobius, which is a interactive guide that uh, is running on top of the Maple engine. That, so the Maple engine is what's driving all of the um, algorithmic generation of parts for the questions and the boring of those questions. Mobius is that interface. Mobius also, and Megan may have more to say about this, but Mobius, we, it, this is all integrated into the Blackboard for us. We're a Blackboard school. So all of these scores end up in Blackboard, all of them get. However, the, the uh, lab coordinator is waiting pre lab data analysis, post lab questions, waiting all that and turning that into a course average, which then, of course, letter grade, and then click off to the registrar at the end of the term. So, you know, that all of that is all the, all the value of a learning management system is available. Mobius integrates with all the uh, standard learning management when we just use that. Excellent. And then Gwen would like to know, uh, what do your students have with them in the lab? Um, do they bring a handwritten notebook? Um, no, in this course, the um, it was a, it, 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 it's an introductory course, large, very large number of students, right? Thousands of students are going through this course. So the lab manual has the procedures, and then the lab manual has a data sheet that looks like the top half of that data and analysis report. So they are asked to you know take the math of something and they write the math down on that line. You know, take the volume of something, write the volume. Of uh, measure the boiling point of something, write the boiling point on that line. So that's what they bring back to transcribe into the online data and analysis report for that to then be machine um, there's, there's a lot to be done uh, in laboratory with um, more, more extensive note taking. And that's not to say that you're not asked to make observations. There are places where they are made to make observations. For example, discharge tubes, they make observations on colors, they make observations on soluble and insoluble. There's a lot of qualitative aspects that's happening in the laboratory. They, and they do write those observations. There's a, so there's places in the data sheet where they are would enter that observation. And then, just to give you a sense, right? How do you machine grade that? How do you put that in that? There is a, they had, when they get to that part of the lab manual that they should enter their data, there's a pull down menu of lots of choices for that observation. What's an example? We, we do flame tests with that spectroscopy laboratory. They also put salt solutions into the flames and they get the colors. They will write down those colors and then they will transcribe those, they will pick those colors from when they enter them. They will pick them from a pull down menu of the possible color choices for all of the metal ions that were described in the introductory material um, that they did before they got into the lab. So that's how we do that. Um, I'm seeing a couple of questions in the chat box. Should I jump on those, Megan, or, or let you direct traffic? Yeah, feel free. Um, that part about notebooks, I, I, I agree. We, and it's kind of a philosophy statement. So when we get into the introductory laboratory, lots and lots of students are going through this laboratory uh, and, and, and other general chemistry laboratories. And many of these students are one, one and done or two semesters of chemistry and done. So our philosophical decision, right, is that the hard, much harder work and, and valuable work, the harder work of Keeping good laboratory notebooks, lot you know, lots of notations of what you do. Coaching them for doing that, we save that for people who take additional laboratory courses beyond the general chemistry laboratory. The thinking is, if the only laboratory course you ever take is general chemistry, you are will not be required to keep a good chemistry laboratory notebook in whatever career you're going to. 
because you know chemistry isn't not enough to get you in a career in chemistry, right? So we save that for the upper division applicants, of course. Um, this course, yeah, is it majors or not? This is our this is not the laboratory course that we give to our um science and engineering majors. Um many of the health career majors are, are intense with the exception of nursing. So this is this is real, that's one of the big populations here. Some of the experiments we do on that other on the science and engineering course are similar, like we do do a discharge lab spectrum. Um the analysis takes a little different track in the science and engineering course. We use the discharge spectrum from a hydrogen lamp and have them determine the Rydberg constant from the, from the data. That level of quantitative analysis of the discharge lamp lines is not required in this when they do the similar observation um, in the um, in this in this more in this nursing in this G of the GOB course. So but does that help with the people who ask about which course is being applied to? I think so. And then there was another question about, um, since this is kind of more for uh, your general uh, chemistry courses then, not necessarily uh, majors, uh, then what is something that you use for your majors? Do you use Mobius uh, for them as well? No, we don't. Right now, the... Um, you're using, uh, I guess, in our, in our school right now, we're using a web assigned product out of ten years. And the uh, and beyond the general chemistry, there is there there's no um, machine grading of the laboratory part. And so the web assigned part is, does have machine grading aspects. Um, what I think is where where what we put together here, sort of very custom, in you know, a little bit of a labor of love, but. It's a lot of this pre lab stuff that has a very strong chemistry content, educational booster shot component to it. Um, and I think those of you who've been in the business for a while know that there's a lot of lab manuals that use a phrase like, as you learned in your lecture course, and move on. And that's not very helpful for the person that doesn't have that concept under control. It used to remind me um, sort of math books that would say, with, with, with in a few elementary steps, you get to this. And then you say, yeah, right. I'm not sure I see how that happened. Uh, so that's so, so this this tries to repair that that aspect of the holes that people know. Yeah, absolutely. And I do feel like um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that um, if someone uh, here on this webinar uh, was, you know, thinking that this would be a great solution for for their chemistry course, um, that this is something that can be uh, customized. Their school name goes on uh, the the cover and things like that. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Oh yeah, I mean if you if you if you are thinking on adopting, let me yeah okay there we go. So okay, <laughs> there there actually are some historical reference within it. I think the lab if a lot of it, you know discoveries in chemistry they tend to get pushed aside a lot as we teach these days in the lecture side. Laboratory does so. I make some connection to that, and the cover tries to do that as well. So these four images are sort of like if you like a history of chemistry laboratories, kind of an alchemy lab, kind of a maybe eighteen uh, hundreds kind of a laboratory thing. Here we are in maybe the last half of the last century. Some of you of my vintage will recognize these electric the, this this standard electrical plug part thing that was in laboratory for connecting laboratory instruments. And this, in fact, is one of our instructional laboratories at Texas. So that's so. There's the history of it, and um, in this little banner down here, uh, red and black are the school colors for Texas Tech. So there's the actual course number and the school colors. And so, if anybody, if you wanted to make a nice uh, down home connection with your own institution, you could swap out a photo of one of your instructional laboratories and. Swap in your school colors to make something a little, a little bit more uh, connected to the students at your institution. So that's, and again, I want to really emphasize the very happy to work closely with you to use one of the ex experiments that are here, but modify speakers for Erlenmeyer class and weighing both for weighing paper, as whatever it is that you need to do. There's a lot of variables in the real. And so, how, whatever fits your laboratory. And then, and then also maybe the larger job 
of saying, this is an experiment we really don't want to abandon. We'd like to still keep it and we bring it into this, this whole umbrella of pre-labs, post-lab, machine-graded lab reports. And the answer is yes, that just takes a little more time. Excellent. All right, do we have any final questions today? It doesn't look like it. Well, thank you everyone for your time today. Thank you for attending. Um, we hope that this content was insightful for you as uh, you know, it's always just kind of such a challenge, but an exciting challenge to see how uh, we can help students learn better um, as the times change and uh, leveraging the technology that we have access to um, is always an exciting thing to be able to, to do with that. So thank you again for your time. Thank you again, Greg, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, the recording will be coming to everyone in the coming days. Uh, and in the meantime, have a wonderful day and thanks again.